Are you ready to take your real estate investing business to the next level? Next level. Well, you're in the right place. This is the Real Estate Investing Morning Show with your hosts, Wayne and Gabby. Good morning, everybody. Today is Friday, July 12th. And it's looking like we're going to have a high of 26 degrees in Edmonton, Alberta, where we are broadcasting and where I am broadcasting by myself this morning. No Gabby. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. We'll see how this goes. This is um, not an ideal situation. Normally, when one of us are sick, we just cancel that morning uh, because this is a really hard thing to do. Talk for an hour. Uh, first thing in the morning at six o'clock. Uh, when you don't have anyone uh, to talk with. Uh, so again, I'll see how we do. Uh, we got, I had a lot planned. I got a lot on the go. Uh, I had a lot in front of me because um, we had lots of different discussions uh, over the last two days, um, mainly around Edmonton, Alberta. It seems to be the topic that everybody wants to talk about right now. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's, the, it's the market that I know best uh, of all the markets. Um, Yes. So uh, there were a bunch of things. Uh, what's uh, there was one question yesterday about? I don't have anything in front of me. See, this is a, this is this going to be difficult. Um, I, we had one question yesterday about um, Edmonton with the fourplex, eightplex uh, properties, the new infill row houses that are being built. Um, what they are is they're, they're, they're essentially a four, a four rows of townhouses that have basin suites. So they're calling them aplexes. Um, the listener was asking about, you know, they're going up everywhere, the amount of units being built for rent. Um, his question was, you know, with the amount of units being built for rent versus ownership is high in his opinion. And he was curious, uh, our thoughts on, do you think we're slowly becoming a renter's economy? And what are your thoughts about finding tenants? Um, if we continue to build more and more of these row house, you know, eight plexes essentially, um, for rent, will the supply eventually exceed rental demand in Edmonton, even with the 1 million people we're expected to add to our population? Good question. Good question. There's another question that came in yesterday as well, uh, that asked, what is your stand with the pre-construction rows of townhouses with suite of basements being advertised as quote unquote multifamily qualifying for MLI select or CMHC MLI select with only 5% down. Uh, and this listener is curious because uh, like the other person, uh, their Facebook is being littered with it right now. Just like everybody else that is, uh, it's being littered on everybody's feeds right now. Um, which we can get into. We can get into that um, this morning. Um, as well, uh, there's a bunch of other questions. Another question came through as well about um, Mill Woods, um, Southeast Edmonton, um, an extension or um, yeah, an extension from the, the conversation that we had the other morning about, uh, was that yesterday or hang on a second, was that the other morning or was it yesterday? It was yesterday, okay, um, about Mill Woods. I guess there was an individual or an investor that actually just bought in Mill Woods and they had a question. So, uh, lots to go through, but uh, thank you guys so much for joining us live. For those of you guys that are here live with us, um, good morning to Philip and Fritz and Crispy and Leo and Adam. Uh, I see you guys here. I see David as well. Um, yes, if you guys came in late, I am by myself. There's going to be a whole lot of ums. Uh, there's going to be some awkward silences while I drink coffee, and I'm going to do my best. It might be a bit of a shorter show. Who knows? It's hard to say. Um, I want to throw a big congratulations out to Gadgen, a uh, longtime listener. Uh, just joined the Real Estate Investing Master's Mentorship Program yesterday. There's me clapping for Gadgen. Congrats to Gadgen on that and taking the step. Um, Gadgen's looking forward to taking his real estate investing business to the next level. Um, he's been at it already. He's been like, he's, uh, he's a big action taker, huge action taker, taker actually. Um, but looking for a little more structure, a little more education to help scale his business even more. So, uh, congrats again, Gadget on that. Um, we had our real estate investing masters, uh, coaching call last night, actually. And, um, he joined at like 
I want to say like five thirty, six o'clock. And then he immediately joined into the coaching call at seven. So that was, that was really cool. Um, last night was, uh, so we do our coaching calls every Thursday night, our group coaching calls, um, where we go over anything from deal analysis to contract analysis to overcoming obstacles. I mean, yesterday, just alone, we talked about, uh, cold calling joint venture partners, um, how to go about doing that, uh, getting mortgage financing while you're self-employed and refinancing when you're self-employed. Uh, we talked about joint ventures. We talked about uh, the New Brunswick Residential Tenancies Act and security deposits. Uh, we talked about uh, rental discounts and late fees. Um, yeah, we talked quite a bit last night, and um, they're always a lot of fun. Okay, well, let's get into some of these questions. First question I'm going to handle. Hmm. Let's do, and by the way, guys, if you have any questions and you're on the live show today, just go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll answer them. It's free coaching every morning, so take advantage of it. Uh, first question I'm going to cover, uh, it's going back to, what day was this? This is going back two days ago when we were talking about uh, month to month um, when did we, how do we answer this question? Okay. I don't have the question in front of me. <laughs> this was where the tenant had uh, a, a lease that went into month to month. Their question is, is that their lease, um, the, the way that they structured, so they got a tenant that they want to get out, but they can't, uh, because it's on month to month. Um, in their lease, they got it written that the term of the lease is a periodic tenancy commencing at 12 o'clock noon on March 14th, 2021 and continuing on a year to year basis until the landlord or the tenant terminates the tenancy. Um, now, they said that they had someone write up this lease for them. By the way, this is for Alberta. They said they had someone write up this lease for them three years ago. So I'm just wanting to confirm that this sounds like I can terminate the tenancy at any point. Um, because they put that little disclaimer in there. Um, the next point says, any notice to terminate this tenancy must comply with the applicable legislation of the province of Alberta, which would be the Residential Tenancies Act. Um, so this doesn't really... Adding that in there, I mean, you have to talk to a lawyer, but adding that statement in there doesn't mean that it will automatically renew to another one year fixed term. Um, I, I think that there, it would be very hard to argue that in a hearing. Um, not to mention the fact that it says a year to year basis, which means that it's not a fixed term lease. That's a periodic lease. By saying year to year, that means periodic. Most people think that it's only one year fixed terms and month to month terms, but no, it could be a week to week. It could be Month to month, it could be year to year, but the difference is is fixed and periodic terms for your lease agreements. And periodic terms uh, have different requirements for terminations of the lease. So technically, even if it's year to year, month to month, day to day, week to week, you're still in a in a periodic tenancy because you allowed your fixed term tenancy to lapse without renewing into a new fixed term. Um, your best bet is to talk to the tenants and try and get them on board with. Um, signing a new lease, a new fixed term lease. Uh, they followed up by saying um, that they, they, they thought they found the answer. Because it's a periodic tenancy, my best option is to do a fixed term lease for six months and then give them three months notice that we will not be renewing with them. Okay, so this is, you're, you're kind of on the right track, but um, the last part is unnecessary. So, if you manage to talk to the tenant and say, hey, looks like we forgot to write up a new lease. Uh, I'm going to be sending over a new six month lease for you. I'll get it, you know, get it, get it signed and, and, and we'll lock in your rent for you. Or you can even do a one year, whatever. Um, you want them out. So I would say, let's, let's do another six months um, and we'll lock in the rent for you. 
at that point, if it's now a fixed term lease for six months, you don't need to offer them a, th a three month notice that you won't be renewing with them. What will happen is at the end of the six months, you just let them know that I'm not going to be renewing. There's no, there's no notice in Alberta. There's no notice requirements. There is, there is in Saskatchewan. I know that. I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it's like 30 days or something like that. Um, you have to notify them that you're not going to be renewing. But in Alberta, there is no notice requirements at the end of a fixed term lease. It is assumed that they are going to be leaving. That's the assumption. It's just the end of a fixed term lease in Alberta it is done. So you won't have to give them any three months notice that you won't be renewing with them. You just wait until the end of the six months, maybe a month before, and just say, hey, just a heads up. Um, we're not going to be renewing the lease. This month, we're going to be showing the suite to new potential uh, renters. Uh, please keep it tidy. So that is the best case scenario is to get them in. It, find some way to get them to sign your fixed new fixed term lease. They don't have to, by the way. I'm just going to point that out. There is no obligation for them to agree. I'm not telling you to be snakish and find some way to manipulate them into into doing it but that is your best case scenario because if you don't and you continue to stay on a periodic um uh tendency there is no circumstances that you can uh, force them to to leave or to terminate their lease unless those those items that we prescribed before which is you are moving in to live into it or family member is moving in to live in it or you're going to be doing a large scale renovation that would require them to leave. And even at that point, you still kind of need to show a good reason why it's um, that whole run eviction thing is, is um, really exploited. Um, so make sure you, yeah. So those are the three options. And then the fourth option is to, um, if you're going to sell the property, but even in that situation, who, if you're going to sell the property to somebody and they're going to inherit, they have to inherit the lease and the tenants and they're, they would be in the exact same position that you'd be in. They have to move into it. A family member needs to move into it or they need to do the old fashioned renovation. So um, rewinding, best case scenario, get do whatever it takes in order to get them to sign a new fixed term lease. Um, that's going to put power back in your hands where you can just wait till the end of the lease and let them know that uh, you won't be renewing. Okay. Unless of course they're in breach of contract. I mean, if they're in breach of the lease, then then it's a faster way to terminate it. But um, yeah, that is that I I'm, I'm remembering the details of this. Sorry. I've got so many different deals in front of me. I'm if for those of you guys that are trying to remember what deal this was, this was the hoarders from two days ago. They were the, the tenants that um, were the clean hoarders. Uh, I think the word was, the wording was, by the way, though, I happened to see the picture of these quote unquote hoarders. Holy shit. I wish I could share these with you. Um, Brooke, if you're listening, um, it would be really cool if you could, if you don't mind in the real estate investing masters, Facebook group, It'd be really cool if you could, uh, if you don't mind sharing these pictures um, so the listeners can see what it is that you're talking about. Because holy shit, this is by far the cleanest hoarding situation I have ever seen in my life. Like, I'm looking at these pictures. It, I don't even know how to describe this. It's, it looks like grandma's house in the 90s. But grandma was a huge collector of like Victorian antiques. <laughs> like <laughs> there is, it is, it's not dirty. It's not dirty. There is just shit everywhere that, and it's just like really, really cool, neat stuff. Like you got so many fucking lamps you got tables with clocks on it. You've got all these old fancy fucking tables and like all these these different plants and flowers everywhere and candlesticks and fucking columbras and 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 fancy mirrors and and, and dishes, old fancy dishes and uh you got old pictures of you know from the 1800s like it, it's it's absolutely crazy. 
Um, I, I really hope that she shares this with you guys. And then there's flowers everywhere on all of the surfaces. It's just lamp. There's in one picture, I can see three lampshades within five feet of each other. The tables are littered with beautiful flowers, teacups, and small plates. It is absolutely ridiculous. And then there's just literally, there's not one piece of the wall that is not covered by an old picture. I've never seen such a fucking clean hoarding situation in my life. <laughs> I really hope you guys get to see that. Okay, I'm going to take a quick little break here. Um, we'll get into the other questions uh, about uh, Edmonton, Millwoods, and the new infill row houses uh, in the Edmonton market. Um this gives me an opportunity to take a little sip of my coffee while we have our break. So I'll be right back. Are you just starting to build your real estate portfolio? At Kirkwood and Brennan, we are real estate investors and mortgage brokers who understand real estate investing. Not only do we help you get a mortgage, but we help you build a better real estate portfolio. Check us out at kbmortgages.ca or call 778-847-0552. Take the time now so you have more time later. Ready to open the door to financial success with smart real estate investments? At Calvin Realty, they understand the power of smart investments. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just getting started, their team is there to guide you every step of the way. Picture this. Great locations, cash flow, and a portfolio tailored to your financial goals. Calvin Realty specializes in identifying great opportunities, turning your investment goals into reality. Say goodbye to guessing whether your next step is the right one. Smart moves, smart investments, Calvin Realty. And we are back. I am back. Not we, I uh, for those of you guys that just joined in uh, during the break there. Yes, it is just Wayne today. Gabby is under the weather. Uh, hopefully she will be better on is today Friday. Yeah, hopefully she'll be better on Monday. And hopefully I don't catch whatever she has. Um, side note, she doesn't listen to the show, so I'm just going to say it. Gabby's got um, Gabby's got this thing where she doesn't like to, to, to wash her hands. Okay. She's... Uh, <laughs> I'm a little, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I was, um, maybe I was altered by the whole pandemic thing. And, um, you know, if I see a, a hand sanitizing station, I grab a little hand sanitizer. I'm like, Hey, what's the harm? What's the harm? I'm right here. Why not just, you know, squirt a little in my hands and then, you know, wipe them as I'm on, you know, on, on route to whatever it is that I'm doing. And I'm a bit of a, a bit of a Nazi with my kid as well. I'm like, hey, kid, just just wash your hands real quick, because you know, you know, kids and touching everything and licking their hands and rubbing their eyes. I'm like, it's just, it's if you're gonna, if someone's gonna catch something, it's gonna be kids with all the stuff they touch and then touching their all their, you know, their eyes and their nose and stuff. Um, so it's it's kind of like it's less about me because you know I'm, I'm I'm fine, but for the kid. In order for her to to, to show her to, to to be a good example, I do it, and then I tell her to do it. Gabby will just walk right by it, and I keep bugging Gabby. I'm like, Gabby, you're the one that gets sick the most, and it's because you're just touching everything and not washing your hands. And here it is. Sure enough, Gabby leaves me alone on a Friday show, which is I would say arguably the best show. Normally Fridays are the best show. Um, Fridays are tip typically I, I want to end the week with a you know on a bang you know like it, I want to. I want to. I want to have an impactful, you know, episode. I want to try and jam it with as much value as possible, so you guys run into the weekend with momentum and inspiration. And uh, and she she leaves me hanging by myself on a Friday episode. So, um, anyways, uh, if, what I would like it if if, if you guys don't mind, um, if you guys if you're listening to the live show or you're listening to the recording afterwards. Please do me a favor, uh, find Gabby on Facebook or Instagram and send her a DM and tell her to wash her hands. Okay. Send her a DM and say, Hey, um, it wouldn't hurt to wash your hands. And I think it would just be hilarious if she gets hundreds of DMs today telling, telling her to wash her hands. She's not in, she, 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 she could use a laugh. She could use a laugh. She's, uh, she's been up all night hacking her brains out. 
So, uh, and, and that's just a reminder to everybody else as well. Hey, you know, make sure you're washing your hands and, um, and not uh, sticking your fingers in your ears, uh, you know, afterwards, um, after you're, after you're out in public, uh, keep yourself healthy. That's all I got to say. Um, Fritz, you're a nurse, right? You work in healthcare. Is this, is this not a good idea? Do you not wash your hands all day? Right? Of course. Of course. Well, that makes sense. I, you know, the reason why I never get sick is because I never leave the house. <laughs> I literally, I wake up every day. I do the podcast. Um, the only time I, I leave the house is if I'm taking my kid to soccer or I stand out in a field in a lawn chair by myself, uh, or if I'm, uh, going for a walk. So it's, it's, uh, I, I, it's a pretty cool, amazing life that I live. This whole financial freedom thing is I just, I've, I've got financial freedom from others. I don't see anyone anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So the next question that came through was um, in regards to yesterday's episode. Must have been a really good episode. If I, considering how many messages I got, I'm trying to compile all these messages and organize them. Um, the listener said, you discussed Mill Woods the other day. I just had an offer accepted for a $510,000 property in Beset, which is in uh, Mill Woods. Beset is actually, um, hmm, I should know this. There's 20, we learned yesterday, there's 29 neighborhoods uh, in, uh, in, in Mill Woods. I think it's the north, isn't it? Where are you? It is actually right in the middle. It is right in the middle of, uh, of Mill Woods. Not a very common, not a lot of people buy and be set. That's interesting. And I think the reason for that is, let me just double check here. Okay. I don't know many people that buy in that little, in that little um, pocket there, but it's, it's right dead center in the middle of Mill Woods. And uh, this listener has, uh, it's got an accepted offer on a property in BSET. It is an up-down bungalow. So a a bungalow with a, a basement suite uh, on an end lot looking to live in the basement and rent out upstairs. So he's going to do a, a house hack. Curious your thoughts. If this is an area you foresee could be successful. Uh, I would, it's a complicated question. Um, I just... Uh, just trying to grab my um, crystal ball. Um, I joke, but uh, I, I don't. I don't have a crystal ball. It's it's that question is very difficult. Um, it's hard for me to foresee the future uh, of of what's going to happen. Um, houses with secondary suites. Okay, let, let me let me let me let me go at it from this angle. There's lots of different property types as we talked about yesterday, uh, five, five different property types. And I'll, I'll repeat it very quickly. You have apartment condos, you have townhouse condos, you have single family houses. Single family houses is like single family and duplexes, same, same, spelled different. Um, I, what I mean is like side by side duplexes. Uh, and then you have um, houses with secondary suites. And then you also have uh, multifamily uh, buildings. See, there's a difference between single family and single families with secondary suites. And the main difference is the fact of your, your buyer pool and it will affect values. And, and you can argue with me all day about this if you want to, but you have to think about what is the usage of this property, right? And I'll, maybe I'll compare it to, you know, single family to multifamily for a second. Home buyers are not going to buy a multifamily property because it doesn't make sense that they're not, that you don't buy a multifamily property as your home, right? You don't buy an eightplex as your home. Yeah, you can argue that you'll live in one unit, rent out the other seven, sure. But the majority of the buyers in the pool looking at multifamily are investors, right? If we go back to single family houses and then comparing it to single family houses with a secondary suite, there are less home buyers looking at 
suited houses than there are looking at single family houses. So that will affect the potential appreciation and affect your ability to sell it in the future. The more eyes you have on it, the more demand you have for it, the more likely that it will appreciate. My belief is that houses with secondary suites are great. They're a great tool to increase income, increase revenue on that property. Obviously, if you had a single family house, you can get a certain amount of rent, but you can get more rent if it had a secondary suite because it's two units, right? Basic common sense. However, if let's say 50% of the buyers of a house with a secondary suite, because not everybody's going to want, sorry, let me rewind. Not everybody's going to want to buy a house with a secondary suite. Some people with five kids are like, I don't need that kitchen downstairs. I need a, I need a playroom, right? Um, and I'm not willing to pay $150,000 more for that house because it's got a kitchen and two furnaces. I don't need that. So think about it. If if you got two houses side by side on the same street, they're both bungalows, both with side entrances. One has a finished basement suite, uh, basement. The other one has a basement suite. The one with the basement suite is going to be about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars more than the house next to it that doesn't have it. That's just the market in Edmonton. In Edmonton, and it's 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 about the same in Calgary, and other markets as well. Each market is going to be unique, but just in Edmonton, it's going to be about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars more on average. So if a family is looking, you know, in this neighborhood and they see both houses for sale, which one are they going to choose? They're going to choose the one that doesn't have a basement suite, right? Now, some families are going to see it as an opportunity. Okay, cool. We can't really afford it. The interest rates are really high right now. We've been, um, we've been pushed out of our affordability because of interest rates. So if we buy a house with a secondary suite, we can live upstairs, we can rent out the basement, and then the revenue that comes in from the basement will offset uh, the, uh, the, the debt servicing. So this way, now we can afford this $500,000 house. That makes sense. But not every family is going to be thinking that way. Larger families are going to be looking for something that has five rooms and they don't, they don't want to pay an extra 150 K for something that means nothing to them. So there's a reduced amount of home buyers. that are going to be looking at a secondary suite house with a secondary suite. With that in mind, if let's say 50 to 75% of people who are going to be buying the house with a secondary suite are investors, then you have to understand that there's going to be a cap. There's going to be a ceiling to which how much an investor is willing to pay for that property both houses on the same street if the values start going up like crazy let's say we go to our crystal ball and 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 we're like okay the values in edmonton are going to skyrocket like they did in calgary the values will not go up the same for those two properties the house of the sec the house with the without the secondary suite is going to probably rise faster and potentially more as far as appreciation than the house with the secondary suite, because ultimately the market is the market. There isn't some magic calculator that determines the houses are going to go up in value. What happens is the market is the market. What I mean by that is that when demand goes up, buyers are willing to pay more. Okay. You'll see it in a hot market. You'll get multiple offers. You'll start seeing houses going for um, selling for over asking price. And what that does is it rises the market, it, it raises the market value, right? Based on the demand. So if there's lots of demand for those houses, then people are going to put lots of offers in. They're going to pay more than what it's worth. And that's going to raise the value of the house, right? That's how the residential market works. And if it continues to stay hot, then it does continue to keep going up in value because that's what people are willing to pay. Investors, though, aren't going to see it the same way on a house that's purpose built, quote unquote, purpose built for investments or for renting. There's going to be a cap or a ceiling to which an investor is willing to pay. And that cap is normally cash flow, has it has a lot to do with cash flow. So if both houses are sitting there on the street, I'll give you real life examples. If the one on the left in Bissette is, without a basement suite, is $350,000, okay? And the one on the right with a basement suite is $500,000. Yes, the house on the left is going to go up in value, and the house on the right might go up in value as well. 
However, how high can the house with the secondary suite go before the interest, but sorry, before the, the financing, the mortgage payment gets so high that there's no cash flow anymore because the rent didn't go up. This is literally actually what's been happening for the last 12 to 18 months in Millwoods because what's happening now is because the interest rates went up, there's not as much cash flow on those properties anymore. And I've actually, this is the first time that I've seen um, a house with a secondary suite in Mill Woods crack $500,000 because they've been sitting at 460, 470 for, for the longest time. And the reason why it was sitting at 460, 470 is because at 460, 470 amortized over 30 years, 80% loan to value and um, 5% interest or 6% interest, it was a break even cash flow. So investors weren't going to buy that property for more than, than 460, 470 because if they did, it wouldn't cash flow with the standard 20% down. But now that rents are starting to, to, are starting to rise and interest rates are starting to come down, now they're, give, they're seeing the opportunity where they can increase the price because investors will now look at this property because it will still cash flow. So investors' mindset around properties is always, first and foremost, what's the cash flow? If I were to put the minimum amount of money down with today's interest rate, what's the cash flow going to be? They'll plug that into their little deal analyzer, Performa, and it will tell, it'll spit out a number for the difference between the rent and the, and the expenses. If there's cash flow, they will buy it. If there isn't cash flow, typically investors would be like, that's a shit deal. It doesn't even cash flow. So you can see how there's going to be a ceiling to which how high the value of a house with a secondary suite can go because investors will only pay up to an amount where it still cash flows. It will not go up the same way that residential real estate does when the demand is high, when there's lots of buyers looking at it. Because there's not as it's not based off of buyers. It's based off of how well it performs as a quote unquote purpose built rental. So I like houses with secondary suites. I own a bunch. However, they haven't seen in the last year as, as, as values have gone up, I haven't seen as much growth in my house with secondary suites as I have with my residential single family houses and townhouses. And that's because it's two completely different markets. So going back to the question, you know, is this an area you foresee to be successful? Yes. Mill Woods is typically a more affordable, Southeast Edmonton is a more affordable section of, uh, of Edmonton across the whole, pretty much the whole, the whole quadrant. However, when you're looking at houses with secondary suites, it's just in a completely different market of buyers. And you have to think like what your buyer is going to think. So yeah, if your house on the left without a basement suite goes up to $500,000, it goes up by 150 k you cannot expect the value of your house with a secondary suite next door to go up by 150 k as well. Because at $650,000 with an 80% mortgage, 20% down, it will not cash flow in today's, with today's market rent. So it might be worth that much in your eyes, but you won't be able to sell it for that much. And if you can't sell it for that much or other people around you are not selling their houses with secondary suites for that much, then the value will be less than, than what it should be in your eyes. I hope that makes sense. If you're buying a secondary suite, you want to focus less on appreciation and more on how this property performs as its own individual entity as a business. I hope that makes sense. It's, it's, it's a tough way to look at it. There's, um, there's so many different houses, secondary suites, multifamily, commercial and residential are so incredibly different. And um, not a lot of people talk about this, um, but I, I'll end it at that. I'll leave it at that. I, I'm not telling you this is a bad investment. That's, that's definitely not the case. If you're going to buy a house with a secondary suite, I recommend buying in Millwoods. <clears throat> I think it makes total sense. Um, but I want you to understand what to expect from the market and what to expect from the values, value increases in the future. I think that um, your biggest consideration that we should be watching for is rents, rents and interest rates. 
And when you get an opportunity when the interest rates are low and the rents are high, that would be typically when I would sell because it will be performing very well that an investor will, will, it will catch their eye, right? Don't sell a house with a secondary suite when interest rates are high, payments, expenses are high, and the, the rents are low because investors won't be interested in it because it's not a good performing asset or business. Take a quick little break and then we'll get into talking about the eight plexes and uh, four plexes uh, questions that came through as well. We'll be right back. It's time to sell your house or buy a new one or an additional one. But where do you start? Do you drive around neighborhoods hoping to spot for sale signs? Do you take a shot in the dark with a real estate listing website? Or do you go with an experienced and focused realtor? Nathareen Legier is the licensed expert realtor you've been hoping you would find. Working in Calgary and surrounding areas, whether you're buying, selling, or investing, Nathareen will help you bridge the gap between you and your real estate goals. Find Nathareen Legier online at houseandhomeyyc.net. Well, 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 investors, you're looking for some lucrative off-market opportunities, but all the good deals seem to have dried up on the MLS. What do you do? You go to Legere Home Buyers, a Calgary premium wholesaling company. That's what you do. Whether you're looking for the next fix and flip, buy and hold, burr project, or redevelopment, you'll find the best off-market deals with Legere Home Buyers. And don't worry, Legere does the work for you. Join the buyers list on calgaryoffmarket.ca and edmontonoffmarket.ca today. You are a professional real estate investor. You are not a professional boxer. <laughs> and you are definitely not a professional bookkeeper. Enter Fingo. Fingo is a professional bookkeeping service by and for professional real estate investors. Your life just got a whole lot easier and your profits are ready to soar. Leave the bookkeeping to Fingo so you can focus on what's most important. Finding the next deal and raising money for it. Schedule your free consultation at Fingo.com. And we are back. And uh, for those of you guys that uh, that missed out on it, two weeks ago, we had a webinar with Steve, um, the managing partner at Fingo Bookkeeping and Tax. And uh, he went through his the, the bookkeeping program that they have available for real estate investors. Highly, highly, highly recommend that. If you don't have a, an investor-focused bookkeeper on your power team, reach out to the guys at Fingo. Go to Fingo.com. Uh, or if you want, you can... Uh, send me a message. You can email us at info at reimorningshow.com or you can send me a DM and uh, and I can send you the link for the uh, webinar that Steve did uh, about the uh, bookkeeping program they have at Fingo. So highly recommend it, guys. It's totally worth it and you're going to save a lot of money. Okay. Uh, back to just what we were talking about. I'm just going to wrap it up, what we were talking about before the break there. I hope this kind of shines a light a little bit more on why me personally, I prefer residential real estate over uh, commercial or multifamily. Um, it's just the way that it operates. I like it better. It's And it's also a little bit more predictable. Um, the demand is higher. The tenant profile is better. And I like the potential for growth. It's a little more predictable. Um, multifamily, commercial, um, and even and even as I just explained, which is not commonly known, but even houses with secondary suites, they're all kind of motivated and 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 controlled by rents. And it's controlled by the, and rents are controlled by the demand in the rental market. So as demand for rentals comes up, rents, you know, then obviously rent prices will go up and then values will go up because of, um, that's just how it works. I just don't like my investments being controlled by rental demand. The, probability of rents going up significantly are far less probable than the values of or the demand for housing, the housing market to go up and values to go up. I just, I don't, 
Like if you've got $2,000 of rent, you're not going to see it go up dramatically overnight to like 2300 It's going to go up very, very, very slowly. And there's just a lot more in the way, um, public opinion and and an affordability for most families. That just the, the, the increase of $300 um, or 15% of rent that quickly is just not realistic because it's just, it's, it, 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 it takes time for, even if the demand is there, it still takes time for rent to go up because it takes time for renters, tenants to accept the new rent. Like rents have been going up in, in, in my markets um, slowly, but like, it's just, it's been taking a long time. And I'm, I, I've been saying for like over a year, like rents are going to go up, they're going to go up, but like, we're just waiting. We're just waiting for each year, each spring season, when all the leases come up, let's see if we can test the market and if they're willing to pay it, right? I like the residential real estate because the demand, the housing demand is a lot more, it's bigger. And if there's a lot of demand for houses, then if I own residential real estate and there's an increase in buyers, the value of my property is going to go up significantly faster and significantly higher. The last thing was tenant profile. Let's just, let's just say it like it is. Tenant profile multifamily buildings are trash. No offense if you live in a multifamily building. I'm just saying that like, if you've ever lived in a multifamily building, it's like, you know, kids screaming and, and it's, it's a little bit of a lower income situation. So you're gonna get a little more, you know, lower income situations. Um, and it's just not, the tenants aren't as desirable as most people. I mean, most of you guys are getting into real estate. They're like, oh, I want to rent to doctors. I want to rent high end, really nice suites so I can attract really great tenants. Um, but, you know, a lot of situations for, you know, one bedroom suites and multifamily buildings are like, the, you're looking at people that are making a little above minimum wage. Not to say that, you know, minimum wage people are of a lower class, but like they're not exactly, let's just be honest with each other. They're not exactly the, the tenant profile that you had in mind when you got into this, right? You're trying to attract the best tenants with lots of extra, you know, money and they'll never miss rent because they make good money and they have good jobs. That's not typically the case with multifamily buildings. So you got to, it's a little bit from the management side and from the expenses side, like the increased repairs and maintenance and vacancies and stuff. Um, and then coupled with everything else I was saying, I prefer the tenant profile of a single family house with a, a mom and a dad who both work, have really good jobs. They make one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 a year, white picket fence, three kids, they go to the school around the corner and they stay for five to 10 years. That is my ideal tenant profile and my ideal investment. Couple that with the, the potential for appreciation because it's all attached and tied to the housing market, the residential housing market, and the demand for home buyers and wanting to get into you know their first time their first homes. It's just a no brainer in my mind. That's just a no brainer to me. But that's my personal opinion. So I hope that gives you a little more insight and context uh, as to you know why it is that I I prefer residential real estate. It's nothing to do with my inability to buy multifamilies. It's just that I don't want them. Now, getting this is going to be a nice little segue into um, you know Fritz's question there about. Um, uh, what's my stance on pre-construction rows of townhouses with suite of basements? So yes, it's all the, it's all the rave, um, in Edmonton, Calgary, and then I'm seeing it in a lot of other cities as well, but it's mainly in Edmonton and Calgary. Um, there are new row houses going up. They're townhouses or row houses, sorry. Um, and they have, uh, secondary suites in the basement. They're being purpose built specifically as multifamilies, um, Multifamily is in quotation. I mean, it is technically multifamily, but um, yeah. But because of the fact that they have so many uh, doors, it's five or more doors, it does qualify for the MLI Select. And the new MLI Select that came out a year ago, two years ago, um, allows up to 50 years of amortization and also 95% loan to value. Um, for those that are new to this, that means 5% down. Um, so everybody is just gaga for this. They're just loving it. And this is why it's it's flooding your social media. It's because everybody wants to get in for less money down. Not to mention the fact that this program actually offers a lower interest rate as well. Lower interest rate than what you're going to get with residential um, investment property, real estate, mortgages, sorry. So lower interest rate, 
longer amortization. That means significantly higher cash flow. Uh, and also um, less money down, which is going to reduce your cash flow. Right? Does everybody understand that? The longer the loan, you know, the lower the payments. However, if you're doing a 95% loan to value as opposed to an 80% loan to value, that means that there's an extra 15% uh, of, of funds in that purchase that you're going to have to add to the mortgage. Hope that makes sense. On a, on a million dollar property, you normally would put $200,000 down, your 20% down payment. In this case, you're only putting $50,000 down. But keep in mind that there's an extra $150,000 on top of that mortgage. It's no longer an $800,000 mortgage. It's a $950,000 mortgage at whatever your interest rate is. So your mortgage payment will be higher because you're financing more. So you're kind of like, you're, you're extending the amortization, which is lowering your payments, right? Because it has to be paid over a longer period of time. However, there's more money on the mortgage. So it kind of kind of levels itself out. But it's still in the long run, there is more cash flow when the loan is longer. Okay. Keep in mind though, in the first 10 to 20 years, I think actually, I, I can't remember. Somebody was talking about this recently. And then I, I checked the math. I, I'm talking out of my ass right now, but do the, do the math yourself. I think it was like in the first 27 years of this 50 year loan, there is a very insignificant amount of money that actually goes to the principal of the loan. And a majority of it is going towards interest, right? Because as the loan is higher, as it sits at $950,000 for this example, the first, whatever, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of the loan, remember it, it you're paying interest on the balance that is left owing. So as the balance is high, you're paying a significantly, your each payment that goes in, let's say a $5,000 payment every month, a majority of it is going towards interest and a very small percentage is going towards actually paying the loan down. But as you start, as it starts tilting, as it starts coming down, and maybe you, you know, in the 30th year, now you've got $600,000 or $500,000 left on the, on the mortgage. Now you're making the same payments and more is going towards the principal and less is going towards the interest. That's what happens. It starts off really high in the beginning of a, um, an amortization schedule. More is going towards the interest because the loan is higher. But as the loan gets lower towards the end of the 50 years, you have the same payment, which means more is going towards paying it down. And the last leg of the mortgage uh, um, uh, amortization or uh, amortization schedule, in the last leg, significant, it, it actually it pays itself off significantly faster because more is going towards the principal. Hopefully you guys got a visualization of that. It's, I explained it okay. So with that, if you're planning on buying this property, 95% loan to value, 50 year amortization, and you're going to sell it in 10 years, just know that you're not going to have a whole heck of a lot paid off that mortgage in the first 10 years. So if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to, I'm going to buy this property, it's got great cash flow, I'm going to live off the cash flow, I'm going to pay myself whatever, $1,000 a month, um, and I'm going to buy 10 of these eight plexes. And then I got $10,000 of cash flow every, every month and I can quit my job. Okay, great. That's fantastic. You're going to do that for the next 10 years. And then your goal is, I heard some guy in a podcast say that, you know, I should maybe look at selling my property after 10 years because all of the, you know, maintenance uh, and, and repairs are going to be required on the time. I'm going to need a new furnace, new hot water tank, new roof. I might as well sell it while it's still in good condition, still has value. I'll get the top dollar for my investment. Great, great, great concept. During the 10 years, you've been spending that $1,000 a month and using it as your, your living expenses, right? You have next to nothing being paid down in your mortgage. So when you go to sell that property, all that you're going to get from the proceeds is the little bit of mortgage pay down that you got, the equity from that, and any appreciation on that property. You're not actually going to be cashing out much pro profits because you've been spending the profits during that time, right? And if you're, if you're banking on appreciation, I have to go back to my argument that I made before the break that this is a purpose-built rental. You are not getting families that are going to be buying this as their home. You're getting investors. And there is a ceiling to which how much that property can appreciate because it's based off of what an investor is willing to pay as long as it cash flows. 
So if you're sitting at a low amount of cash flow right now, and you're expecting to sell it for more to an investor, the investor is going to run their numbers and their performer or their deal analyzer, whichever. They're going to underwrite it. And they're going to be like, yeah, well, if I buy it at this price, it's going to be negative $200 a month in cash flow. So the best I can pay you is this much. They will pay whatever they're willing to pay so long as it cash flows. So the whole prospect of it appreciating because the Edmonton market is so hot and the values are going up, you can't make that argument because the value of the, res- the, the, the residential market and how hot it is has nothing to do with the multifamily market because the buyer demand is for residential properties, not for purpose-built multifamily properties. What you need, if, you're, if your goal is to get appreciation, you need to be in a strong rental market where you know the rents are going to be going up. And we are in that position. I will, I will say that. We are in that position. However, how much more can the rent go up before an Edmontonian can no longer afford rent? Because there's a ceiling to which how much a tenant will pay in rent as well, based off of the affordability in the area or in Canada. Plain and simple, a a family who makes $150,000 a year can't afford much more than $2,200, $2,300 a month in rent. So if you think you're going to bump this main floor suite up to $3,000, which is going to increase the value of your property, you're crazy. It's not going to happen because a family in Edmonton cannot afford $3,000 a month in rent. It's just like that, that is actually, there's, there's like, you could argue, yeah, well, they're just gonna have to sell their truck or whatever, but like that's borderline poverty. Like that's borderline. They, they will like, there's mathematically the cost of living. They won't be able to cover it. It's not realistic. So my, my position on the multifamily properties is very similar to my position on the suite of houses and, and everything that we've been talking about for the last half an hour. Um, I think it's great that these properties have this really cool incentive that is the uh, CMHC MLI Select Program. I think if the MLI Select Program wasn't there, nobody in their right mind would touch any of these properties. Because if you compare these apples to apples, to a residential property, meaning you put it on a 30-year amortization with 5.5% interest rate instead of four or whatever it's at, and also with 20% down, 80% loan to value. Nobody in their right mind would pay for these properties because they would be like negative $2,500 a month in cash flow. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating either. If you set aside money for property management, which you have to do as part of the requirements, and you also set aside for repairs and maintenance of, let's say, 2% of your rent, and then you add 8% for vacancy, and you do all this properly, and you compare it apples to apples with a residential property, a residential property is probably in the 100 to $300 of cash flow. Sorry, I can't, let me rewind that. It's, I, I need to show you guys the math in order to understand that. It, the the multifamily like the new four row houses with basement suites it would be probably negative two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars a month in cash flow so the only reason they're performing well is because it has they have access to the incentive which is the lower interest rate the longer amortization that's the only reason they're working otherwise they're significantly overpriced based on the market rent for those properties because the market rent is 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 not much higher than what you pay for a similar unit in, in the residential space. The other, the, the big reason why you're seeing everybody jumping for this is because MLI Select. That's it. Everybody's looking at 5% down 50-year amortization. They're v- being very, very basic about the way that they look at it. And they're not thinking about the deep. They're not going any deeper than that. They're not thinking about what's my return on investment. What's my cash on cash return? What's the prospect for this to appreciate? What's my tenant profile? Well, tenant profile, I'll say, is is pretty decent. It's not the best tenant profile, but it's better than a than a than a one bedroom suite in a multifamily. Because they're these are new and nicely renovated or nicely constructed. So the things that you need to be looking at, tenant profile, you need to be looking at potential for growth, appreciation. 
You need to look at your cash on cash return and your return on investment. And if you if you looked at those last three, you would realize that the the math doesn't add up. And this is what the listener was 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 saying is that everybody's talking about this, but I'm doing the math and it's not adding up. Like it seems too risky. And good for you because you're one of the few people that have actually noticed this. I'm trying not to shit on everybody because everybody's doing it. And if I start talking poorly about it, that means I'm going to hurt a lot of feelings and I'm going to lose a lot of friends. So I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to explain this to you. You know, do whatever you want to do, whatever you think is the best investment, go for it. Right. I just stick to the math, but I'm not here to tell people what to do. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to share this with newer investors who are in a position where you tend to be following what everybody else is doing because you think that's the right thing. And the masses right now are kind of leaning towards that. And I don't like it because the masses are all kind of, it's, it's the blind leading the blind. That's the way that I look at it. No offense, no offense, but I've, I've offered, I've offered this up for quite some time now. Somebody please show me the numbers and prove to me that this will outperform residential real estate. And nobody's offered it up. No one, because they know I'm right. Or they don't know how to run the numbers themselves. They don't even know how to run the numbers. So my opinion is on residential real estate, which would be in my market, condo townhouses and single family houses and houses with secondary suites. That's my opinion. In that order as well. Um, based off of everything that I said today. Um, the triplexes, fourplexes, eightplexes, these new infill row house properties. I think that they're really good. I think that th there's nothing wrong. With, I just don't think that they're as good, right? And when you look at it from a numbers perspective, and I do this on a regular basis, I'll, I'll pull the cash and cash numbers. I'll pull the ROI numbers and I'll pull the cash flow numbers as well. Um, typically it's at the bottom of the list for as, as far as best performing properties, but it still works. It's not to say that you shouldn't buy it. If that's what you're looking for, if that's the tenant profile that you want, if that's the type of property that you want as well, like newer properties that are that don't require a lot of um, maintenance because they're all everything is brand new, not as many repairs, it's turnkey, it's easy, and and it's a lower interest rate. Yeah, absolutely. I then then do it. Um, this isn't a right or wrong thing. It's just that's my opinion, and that's what was asked: is what is my stance? What's my opinion on these properties? Um, I'm, I'm actually, ironically, I'm looking at some right now. Um, me personally, if I were going to buy it, I would be looking at less of the, okay, now I'm going to fucking flood the market. Watch this. I should, I should buy it before I actually say it. Um, uh, I, I like, I like the properties where they are, they're broken up into single family houses and you still use the MLI select program. Let me try and explain this better. Um, rather than having four row houses connected to each other with basement suites, I there there are s situations where you can have them built where there are four single family houses with secondary suites, and they're all next door to each other. And if you buy them all, it qualifies for the MLI select program. Personally, I... I like that situation better because they're larger, they're more separated, um, and they're about the same price, to be completely honest. Um, so that's that's what I'm looking at is is more of the uh, there's um there's a couple in um, in Saskatoon that uh, did a big project there. I think it's all done now. Um, I think they did six houses, if I recall correctly. Um, yeah, you, Fritz, I see in the comments there, you're probably talking about the same couple. Um, uh, in Saskatoon, I think it was six houses in a row and they all had basement suites and it qualified for the MLI select program, uh, which I thought was super cool. So that's, um, I would prefer something more like that personally. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's my opinion. Uh, the last thing I was going to add was um, my... Oh, it's a, I'm right at the one hour mark. So I'll just, I'll finish off with this. Um, my last, you asked for like my stance on it, my position on it, um, my opinion. 
most people haven't read the requirements for the CMHC MLI Select program. And it's actually coming to light a lot lately because I've been talking about it and a lot of people have been getting, a lot of attention has been on it now. Uh, not to mention the fact that a lot of people have been, I'll, I'll rephrase this, um, lots of people jumped into it. They put their 5% you know, deposit down and they got construction ready. And now it's been about a year and they're all coming to time where they need to uh, refinance with CMHC. And they're learning about all the requirements for uh, this program. And what most people don't know is there is a net worth requirement and there's also a DCR requirement, a debt servicing requirement or debt coverage ratio requirement. And you need to fit this criteria and meet these requirements in order to get the full 50 year amortization and 95% loan to value. And most of these properties don't, they, they aren't meeting the debt coverage ratio. And if you don't meet the debt coverage ratio, meaning the, the rent to cover the, the debt, then you have to put more money down in order to reduce the loan amount. And so many people are running into this right now where they're like, they had their 5% down. They thought, oh, it's great. I have to I only I need 5%. And then comes time to get approved and the lender comes back and says, okay, we can give you up to 88% loan to value. So you need to come up with 12%. And they're like, whoa, 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 I don't, I've only got five. And they're like, well, you need to bring 12. We'll do 88%. And they're, everybody's fucking going frantic because they're like, where am I going to get this extra money from? You know, when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about a $2 million property, for example, that extra 7% is 140,000 fucking dollars. <laughs> this isn't fucking pocket change. This isn't, you know, you're not going to find this in the dresser or you're not going to find this in your coat, your winter jacket pocket is a hundred and forty thousand dollar shortfall that these investors are having and they're like what the fuck they didn't tell me and it's because the, you need to you need to do your research before you buy these things so your 95 percent loan to value is not guaranteed okay they keep changing the fucking rules <laughs> on a regular basis and also your 50 year amortization is not guaranteed either. So what I'm seeing most people doing these types of properties, all said and done, they're landing at like 40 year amortizations with 88% loan to value. That's the average of what I'm hearing and seeing. And once all said and done, they're not performing. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're okay. They're, they're performing okay. But like when you had it at a five, when you calculated your ROI originally at 5% down, and now you have, to recalculate your numbers at 12% down, the ROI is not nearly as high as what everybody thought it was going to be. And your cash flow is not as high because you're amortized over 40 years instead of 50. So it, there's just a lot to consider and a lot that people don't understand. And I think that new investors jumping into this as their first investment because everybody else is doing it is a terrible idea because it's complicated. And the last thing is, is that I can't remember this exactly. Don't quote me but you need to have a minimum of 25% of the loan value in net worth. So on that $2 million property, uh, 88%, it's a $1.76 million loan. You need to have a net worth of at least 25% of that. It means you need to have a net worth of $440,000. Most of the new investors don't have that. And, that's another thing I'm hearing about is like people like frantically running around trying to ask for co-signers to jump on this deal for them in exchange for equity because they don't have the, the net worth in order to meet the requirement. Hopefully that offers a little more perspective for everyone. Um, again, that, it's not saying that it's a no go that you shouldn't do it, but there's just a lot of uncertainty and uh, lack of understanding around it which is frustrating to watch um, when there's a personally, in my opinion, there's a much easier, simpler and, and safer way to go about doing it. But you know what? Uh, different strokes for different folks. Um, you do what you want to do. It's completely fine. I'm not here to judge. 
Um, but hopefully that offers a little bit better perspective for each and every one of you to, to, to when you're considering uh, something like that. I did it. I managed. I didn't finish my coffee, obviously, because I've been blabbering on this whole time. But, uh, you know, thanks for joining um, today, guys. And, and thanks for joining all week and every time. Um, we really appreciate being here with you every morning uh, live on the show. And for all of you guys that join in a little bit later um, onto the recordings, onto the, you know, all the different podcast platforms. I really do love doing, uh, doing this every morning. I love doing it with Gabby. Hopefully she'll be back on Monday. Hope you guys are inspired. I hope I provided you guys some more information. Hopefully uh, maybe, maybe um, lit a few light bulbs and you guys can take that and, and that momentum this weekend and do something with it. Um, hope that you guys have a great weekend and I will see you all on Monday. Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Looking for more guidance and coaching? The REI Master's Mentorship Program might be what you're looking for. For more information, email info at reimasters.ca.